Assalamu alaikum, everyone. I'm so disappointed not to be with you all in person, but I'm hopeful that with a uh, recording, we'll be able to reach a larger audience than we would have if the ISNA convention had been held in person. I'm going to share um, some slides with you, and I hope that we don't have any technical difficulties that uh, you know we're kind of prone to have when we prepare something like this. So let's see, inshallah, bismillahirrahmanirrahim. So even with the hardships that we have faced in the last year and a half, we still have much to celebrate and be thankful for. And as we look forward to moving beyond the hardships, it's important that we do so with a renewed vision. If you listen to the talk by my colleague, Quran Shakir, she spoke about the Clara Muhammad school's history and um, how they were the first Islamic schools to be established in the US. And if you heard from Shaza Khan, she spoke about the current statistics based on ISLA's research in regards to these schools and some of their achievements. I'd like to add to what you've already heard, but I'll begin by first telling you a little about CISNA, as that will expand on how much we have to celebrate. CISNA stands for the Council of Islamic Schools in North America, and we are committed to building a legacy of excellence in Islamic education. It was in 1989 that ISNA organized an educational symposium. They gathered Muslim educators, community members, and representatives from many Islamic institutions throughout the US and Canada. This symposium resulted in the appointment of a committee, which by 1991 established the Council of Islamic Schools. CISNA is unique in that it's a representative organization, meaning all member schools have a voice and a vote, Initially, CISNA's main purpose was to serve as a unifying organization and provide professional development. CISNA has now grown to include four main areas of focus, accreditation, advocacy, professional development, and outreach. By 2012, CISNA had established itself as an accrediting agency with unique Islamic standards. It has partnered with two global accrediting agencies, to provide dual accreditation and also provide standalone accreditation. CISNA is the largest and only Islamic school organization in the world. We now have almost 40 accredited schools in the US with about 20 more that are pending accreditation. The second area of focus for CISNA is advocacy. Our voice impacts legislation and policy at the state and national level. It helps our schools financially, and protects their interests by informing policy and decision makers to better understand the outstanding work Islamic schools are doing to contribute to the betterment of society. We monitor guidance released by national and state agencies and disseminate information to Islamic school leaders. CISNA works with CAPE, which is the Council for Private American Education, the Department of Education, the White House Office of Academic Engagement, the Johns Hopkins Institute for Educational Policy, and that's just to name a few. Our advocacy efforts actually resulted in being, CISNA being asked by the US Department of Education to nominate a principal for the National Distinguished Principal Award. Habib Qadri was given the award and invited to the White House in 2019, and Dr. Iram Jalani was awarded the honor in 2020. The third area of focus for CISNA is to provide professional development for school boards, administrators, and teachers. In 2020 alone, CISNA conducted 25 webinars free of charge for our schools. CISNA also partners with ISNA to organize two national education conferences, one in Chicago and one in Los Angeles. CISNA also has a YouTube channel where educators are able to view recordings of presentations that they may not have been able to attend in real time. The fourth area of focus for CISNA is outreach. CISNA links with the US Department of Education and the White House to ensure resources are made available to our schools on a timely basis. It was because of these efforts that many of our schools were able to receive free PPE such as masks at the onset of the pandemic. CISNA's outreach efforts have connected Islamic schools to other faith-based education organizations to form really strong coalitions. CISNA also formed specialized WhatsApp groups when schools became hybrid or virtual 
And this allows for timely and relevant discussions and sharing of resources. Um, a huge benefit of these groups is that educators feel a sense of community by getting to know and share or commiserate with each other, um, even though they're not able to do so in person, they can, they can be sharing from all over the country or all over the world. In fact, we have schools on these groups that are located in the Virgin Islands, in India, and in the UK, and even in Kenya. In 2020, Cisna earned the Guide Star Platinum Seal of Transparency. That's a lot of growth. It's a lot of growth to celebrate. But what's really astounding is the growth in the number of full-time Islamic schools in the U.S. There was an 800% increase from 1991 to 2015. We went from having 4,482 students in 1991 to 40,485 students in 2015. Now, partly as a result of this growth, some very valid questions and concerns have been raised from Muslims and non-Muslims in the community. Will graduates from these schools go on to be positive contributing members of society? How are Islamic schools held accountable? How effective are these schools in providing a quality academic education? How effective are they in developing and preserving an Islamic identity? Some of these questions actually prompted the research and writing of a book by Dr. Charles Glenn from Boston University. The book was titled Forming Muslim American Citizens, Islamic Schools as Cultural Mediators, in which he makes a statement about our students saying, it is through their faithfulness as Muslims, rather than by abandoning Islam, that they would be valuable American citizens. That's a lot that can be said about how Islamic schools ensure that they're graduating good citizens and that's for an entire session on its own. As for the question about accountability, accreditation is one answer. Accreditation standards as developed by CISNA have been designed to hold schools accountable for following their mission. The CISNA standards were revised in 2020 after consulting with Muslims and non-Muslim experts in the field of education. The questions about school effectiveness are addressed by talking about the concept of mission. Mission and vision are sometimes used interchangeably, so I want to talk briefly about the difference between the two. A vision statement describes a desired future, the hopes and dreams of what we want to become. The mission statement focuses on today and what we do. As I talk about mission and vision, I may use the two terms interchangeably, and that's okay because they are often conflated. It's generally agreed that for a Muslim, the purpose of life or being successful in life is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and serve humanity. Muslim scholars, such as Ghazali, Al-Farabi, and Ibn Sina, to name a few, all emphasized lifelong learning, a focus on religious education, the Quran and Sunnah, sayings and actions of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as sources of knowledge, and the importance of good moral character of the teacher as well as that of the student. The goals of education identified by these philosophers included social goals as well, such as public service, as well as individual goals, such as cultivating moral conduct. Islamic schools today, as did the educational institutions established 1200 years ago, focus on faith formation along with academic excellence. I conducted a study of 50 Islamic school mission statements from my master's thesis at the Bayan Islamic Graduate School Five broad themes that emerged across these school's mission statements are academic excellence, spiritual development, civic responsibility, leadership, and a safe, nurturing Islamic environment. These themes correlate with the purpose of education as identified by early Muslim scholars. What this means is that our overall vision has not changed. That's not to say that each community must have the same goals. One school may emphasize their HIFS program, while another may stress the importance of learning the Arabic language. Yet another may highlight the importance of taking care of the environment. So why is mission a point of discussion if I just told you that almost all schools share five basic concepts in their mission statements, which also align with the purpose of education as outlined by Muslim scholars of the past? I promise I will get to that, but first, I want to talk about the importance of the role of mission as a factor of success in Islamic schools. 
Research shows that there is a strong correlation between fidelity to mission and institutional success. The mission statement provides guidance to school leaders as they develop initiatives and strategies. A clear mission statement also facilitates the decision-making process. It serves as a navigation tool and it is essential when discussing or debating programs and decisions to refer to the mission statement. So let's say we have a clear, well-developed mission statement. What do we do now? An organization that is purpose-driven needs a leader who is also guided by purpose. It's the responsibility of the board to hire a principal who will maintain mission integrity. In fact, hiring the right principal is the single most important undertaking of the board. The leader of the school must be able to transmit the sense of mission importance to his or her staff. When staff members understand the larger impact of their work, it leads to greater engagement, passionate commitment, and motivation. Staying focused on our vision and mission as a community ensures that every decision we make aligns with the mission we have set for ourselves. And this also applies to a, a personal as well as institutional mission. If a child has a goal of becoming an engineer, he or she must plan to take the courses necessary and participate in extracurricular activities that will result in the achievement of that goal. So now to answer the question of why we should be connected with mission and renewal. Sorry, why we should be concerned with mission and renewal. I have seen many schools lose sight of their mission. This happens for a few reasons. One reason is they may lack the capacity, whether financial or, or human, to be able to focus on the big picture because they're so busy with the day-to-day -day survival of the school. Another reason, which is very common, is that there's no policy in place to ensure that mission is given its due. There are a few signs that indicate mission drift. One is when board members and administrators cannot articulate the mission statement. Another sign is when the focus is on short-term goals rather than the long-term impact of extra and co-curricular activities and programs on school mission. A third sign of vulnerability to mission drift is the absence of a systematic application of their mission. So what do we do? We try to safeguard the mission. A means to safeguard mission integrity and ensure fidelity is by establishing procedures that ensure mission alignment. Developing a school improvement plan, preparing the budget, deciding on curriculum and measuring school performance must all occur with careful regard to the school's mission. Establishing hiring practices that require a discussion of the school's mission with the potential staff member is also essential to safeguarding the mission. Another uh, method of ensuring mission integrity is to anchor all your curricular and extracurricular programs to the school's mission. Once the, the themes from a school's mission become a consistent part of the language used in a school, mission values become embedded in the culture and are more easily articulated in all aspects of a school's program. But are Islamic schools holding themselves accountable to meeting their mission and goals? Well, we can only answer this question by reviewing and renewing our mission. So how do we as a global community support the mission of our schools? We need to strengthen the Islamic school system and we need to create unity and community among Islamic schools and educators. To do this, we have to evaluate, we have to elevate the quality and provide resources. So I've already mentioned CISNA accreditation as one means of improving the quality of our schools. We would ask that you support organizations like CISNA, ISLA, and ISNA who are working towards school improvement. What we can also do is support the school choice movement. Consider this, if a fire occurs in a private school, no legal question is raised about providing public assistance through a local fire department. The same is true for protective services by law enforcement agencies. When human lives and public health are at risk, the state has an obligation to protect its people. 
All schools should have the resources to keep their children safe and healthy and to maintain quality of their students' education. Neil McCluskey, the director of the Cato Institute Center for Educational Freedom says, let people choose schools without sacrificing their tax dollars to institutions that teach things they deem inappropriate or unacceptable. We force all people to pay for public schools, but the schools cannot treat all diverse people equally. Requiring all people to fund secular public school schools discriminates against religious persons. If you're unfamiliar with school choice, please contact CISNA at CISNA office at isna.net and we'll be able to um, explain further and we'll be happy to, to offer you some resources and let you know what things you can do to promote school choice in your communities, in your state and in your districts. So coming back to the theme of this session, let's celebrate all that we have accomplished and let's keep moving forward through the hardships by renewing our vision for a children's future. Thank you for listening. <laughs>